Hello. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank you all for uh, taking out the time and, and joining this workshop. And secondly, thank you, Architerax, for, for organizing this. I hope it's OK to start. Or would you like me to wait another five minutes if there are more participants coming in? I'll take yes for no response. So uh, just to give you a heads up, I'll, um, if at any point during the presentation, if you feel like I'm not clear enough, you can let me know. If you have questions during the presentation, you could always raise your hand and, and we can probably have a discussion right there, right then. And try to see this more as a, as a discussion based, uh, I don't know, like a course instead of just uh, me speaking and, and having like a one sided workshop. So yeah, try to make it as interactive and try to get out of it as much as possible. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Since I cannot see myself, I would prefer to have my camera turned off and then I'll turn it back on when we when we start to have a discussion. So this way we can both focus on the presentation. Okay, so I'll, I'll start the presentation by talking uh, actually by, by introducing myself a little bit before we start uh, before we start the workshop. So I'm an urban landscape designer, an architect, and a sustainability enthusiast. That's uh, pretty much what I call myself since I don't have any other designation than that. <laughs> I'm presently working with NOF Architects in Montreal as an architectural graduate. I, I hold a post-professional master's of architecture in urban design and housing from McGill University. I hold a master's in science and sustainable architecture and landscape design from Politecnico di Milano and a bachelor of architecture from Sushant School of Art and Architecture in New Delhi, India. And prior to working in Montreal, I have worked in architecture firms in both Italy and India. And I would also like to highlight that I, I am a lead accredited professional. So I specialize in building design and construction. And during the course of the presentation, I will, I will try to sort of link certain strategies that we discuss to, to lead certifications as well. It's, it's it, honestly, it's not something that's going to be very specific for lead because even Bream and, and a lot of energy codes nowadays use similar strategies. So, I mean, getting to know more about one would be, would be good enough to sort of get yourself acquainted with, with pretty much a lot of others. Also, just to give you a heads up, sometimes when I'm presenting, I tend to speak very fast. So if that's happening, please uh, do not hesitate to point that out. I want this to be as clear for you guys as, uh, as possible. So if at any point you feel like what I'm saying is unclear or, or if if what I'm trying to put forward is not making that much sense to you, please feel free to raise your hand or point it out and we can and we can talk about it right there, right then. Now, the way I've structured the presentation today is that I've kept the, I've tried to get the slightly boring stuff in the very beginning. So we'll talk about certain numbers, certain metrics, certain like more um, term-based scenario in the very beginning. And, and the second part, I will try to discuss my project. So we'll have more rituals and and more graphics to play with around that. And now since nowadays everyone is, is kind of well aware of the need for sustainable design, I won't spend too much time elaborating or discussing that either, nor will I specifically lay out strategies for you to follow. So it's not going to be like a one-stop solution. I'm not going to say these are the strategies, learn them, go ahead, do it. No, I will try to highlight these strategies, so these sustainable strategies during the course of the presentation. So at different stages with probably projects with just simple terms, and I sincerely hope that students or professionals can incorporate these in their own designs or at least consider them during the process, during, during when they're designing. Also for the projects chosen, sorry, I, I was just about to go next, but I thought I would bring this out. For the projects chosen, I'm gonna present one of my master's thesis. The, others, the other one is going to be a competition entry that I did last year. And the third one, it's going to be a mixed use residential project, which I worked in my, in my present office. And I felt choosing these three distinct kind of projects would kind of uh, help us to cover uh, cover different ways, I would say, like, you know, the analysis and research or, or the presentation style of an, of an academic project versus how to go about doing a competition or even an actual professional real project. 
So I'll start by discussing these charts, the most boring of them all, but I felt like this was important for, for a sustainable workshop, just to sort of run down the numbers a little bit, because <clears throat> honestly, the first question would be like, why are we so keen on making the, the architecture and construction industry sustainable? I mean, how much effect that can have? So this is from 2015, and I sincerely hope that things have gotten better now, but at least this will be a good enough, this will be good enough to stress on the need for us to act on it. So the first chart here, the one on the top, <clears throat> it shows the share of global energy consumption by sector, and we can easily see that the buildings and construction industry constitutes about 36% share in it. The second chart at the bottom is the share of global energy related CO2 emissions by sector. And we can again, we can see that the buildings and construction industry constitutes about 40% in it, 40% share in it. Now, these are really concerning numbers. I mean, at least for me, they would be because about one third energy consumption and slightly over one third CO2 emissions are coming from buildings and the construction industry. I would say that's not a good sign. And so if we can make these numbers, if we can change these numbers, or if we can have an impact on these numbers, just with the buildings and construction construction industry, I feel that can that can sort of make a bigger change overall. Now, just one slide for sustainable architecture, because again, like I said, schools are pretty much teaching this. Everybody's aware of it on social media. There are different movements going on. You hear about different treaties everywhere. So I won't, I'm not going to stress too much here. I'm just going to kind of brief through this quickly. So sustainable architecture is a general term that refers to buildings designed to limit the impact of the humans of humans, sorry, limit the impact that humans have on the environment. So it's an eco-friendly approach to modern day building and includes every aspect of the planning and construction process, including the choice of materials, the design and implementation of heating, cooling, plumbing, waste, and ventilation systems, and the integration of the built environment with but also how it sits within its context. That's that's very important when we talk about sustainability. And of course, it has benefits. So <laughs> it has environmental benefits such as restoration of natural resources, reduction in energy consumption, and waste generation. This is something that we'll look at later in detail when I do, when I discuss my thesis project as well. Uh, it helps to protect ecosystems and environmental biodiversity. Economic benefits range from reduction in long-term costs and dependence on traditional energy sources to improve productivity and upgrade in, value, in property values. Also, there's something that I've not mentioned here would be, uh, I, I didn't know if I should put it in economic benefits or structure benefits, but really if you're going sustainable, a lot of um, municipalities or city regulations, they, they sort of let you slide by a few things if you're making the building sustainable as simple as they, they might let you increase your building or buildable area if if you're using all, all sustainable strategies. So that's also like a negotiation that you can have with the city. Finally, the social benefits include improved living conditions, health and comfort for inhabitants and improved in water air quality, which is again also a part of the environmental benefits. Now that we've briefly looked at sustainability and its benefits, I'll discuss a few metrics in architecture, which I feel are becoming more and more important every day. Energy codes around the world are getting stricter every year and architects need to prepare themselves to be able to completely understand and work with these codes. So I know New York, for example, launched a new energy code last year. Montreal is going to implement it this December. And all of these energy codes are much, much more stringent than, than what they used to be. And it's not just following them, but the first step would be to understand them. And for that, you have to have a certain knowledge base to understand certain terminologies and why they have such a big impact on, on sustainability in architecture. So the first step is to understand the key metrics needed to conduct early stage analysis and collaborate across various teams. That's a major part of our job as architects as well. We are also mediators. Now with buildings responsible for about 39% of the total carbon emissions, the design practice is also evolving to, to sort of, you know, it's evolving to bake in data-driven energy efficiency. I heard a sound. I'm not sure if that was a question or if that's someone joining in. I just want to make sure how it's working because I cannot see the screen here. I'll continue presenting. I think probably questions will happen at the end. So uh, yeah, I, I was saying that um, the design practice is now evolving to sort of bake in and you know, it's, it's more data driven energy efficiency now and, and yeah. And this change is leading architects to quickly become building performance experts and create spaces that are high performing and healthy for occupants. So it's, uh, 
it's kind of becoming a more complex job and it's kind of uh, encompassing a lot of various um, how should I say fields and, and different streams and, and 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 architects need to be at least aware or acquainted with these to be able to manage the work now i think the first metric that i will look at is all and trust me like all the metrics that i'm going to share it's just i think it's going to be four or five and these are pretty much the part of all energy codes around the world. This is a part of LEED. It's a part of BREEAM. And in general, I think it's it's also quite helpful when you're making early design decisions and it can have a major impact on how your building is performing eventually. So the first one that we look at is called energy use intensity. It refers to the energy required to operate and sustain the project once it's occupied. Now, keep in mind, this is once it's occupied. It's not taking into account anything which happens before. It's simply once the building is occupied, people are in it, and now what happens? So it's not taking into the into account the construction or, or any, any other related stage. This metric is a factor of the floor area and the annual energy consumption expressed as the energy per square foot year, per, sorry, energy per square foot per year. Now, by calculating the energy energy use intensity of a building, architects can better predict the building's yearly utility cost. So you can precisely know how much it's going to cost you annually to keep the building functioning. And it's kind of common sense. Like if you know that how much annually a building is costing you to make it run, you can sort of understand that your design decisions, what impact can they have on that annual consumption and that annual cost? So let us say a project is based is based out of Montreal, Canada. Now the city has extremely cold winters, so if the building is not well insulated, the cost of heating interior spaces in the winters would be very high, and of course the energy-related consumption would go up as well. So also by reducing the energy use energy use intensity, your project can gain points for lead in the energy and atmosphere category. So they have a different category in lead called the energy and atmosphere category, and it has different credits in it. And I think about three or four credits kind of uh, ask you to use the energy use intensity as, as a metric. So it's just, you should be understanding what it's, it's basically space heating, pump fans, space cooling, any kind of energy which is going into, into having your building operational and running. That's, that's right here. And like I said, it's going to be slightly boring in the beginning. We, we move on to the project. So bear with me in this part of the presentation. <clears throat> now also write down your questions because I think we're going to have them at the end. Now the second metric, oh, okay. The second metric we will look at uh, is the spatial daylight autonomy and the annual solar exposure. So both of these they kind of go hand in hand, and uh, it, it's it's something that you were always aware of. At least I always was, but I just didn't have a term for it and how to measure it. Like it's something that we always kind of even subconsciously maybe consider when we're designing. So. Now, the spatial daylight autonomy describes the percent of space that receives sufficient daylight. Simple, that's it. Now, everybody prefers to have their interior spaces naturally lit, lit as much as possible. And, and I mean, to support that, research highlights that access to daylight benefits the health, happiness, and productivity of building occupants. So now, to become a little more specific about it, spatial daylight autonomy describes the percentage of floor area that receives at least 300 lux for at least 50% of the annual occupied hours, that's usually between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. on the horizontal plane, that's 30 inches above the floor. So that's roughly your, your table height, roughly about that. And this is important because usually the, 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 the metrics that concern daylight, they always work on a certain horizontal plane. It's not going to be up on the ceiling. It's not going to be down on the floor. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's where even you have to measure. Like that's, that's the area where they also measure the daylight. Now, keep in mind that nobody prefers to have too much direct sunlight as well, or, or even glare in their interior spaces. And this is where the other one, which is the annual solar exposure, comes into the picture. It refers to the percentage of space that receives too much direct sunlight. That's about thousand lux or more for about, for at least, sorry, for at least 250 uh, occupied hours per year. Now this amount of direct sunlight can cause glare, glare, creating discomfort in the interior spaces. It can even increase cooling loads due to the creation of hot spots within your floor plate. So you don't want that. Now when designing, keep in mind that shading structures can have a significant influence on glare, on glare penetrations without cutting down on beneficial daylight. So that's that's all you have to sort of think about when probably working, working with projects. So at least with modern day buildings, I would say. 
that you you need enough light to make the environment comfortable, but not enough that it becomes it becomes sort of discomfort discomforting for the occupants. And the models that you're seeing right now on screen, like on both of these, these are direct models. So you can actually use direct two to calculate daylight as well. So it, it, you don't require some very special or, or, or sort of a very high tech tool for doing that. Your direct models can work well enough. But I think your building has to be very properly georeferenced. So that's something that you should look at. And again, this one, uh, even this, these two points, the SDA and ASE, both of them have a special uh, credit that kind of assigned to them in Leeds energy and atmosphere category. The third metric we will discuss today is the indoor water use and density. This is used to determine how much water a building will require during its years of occupation. So again, it's, it's years of occupation, nothing that has happened before during the construction. And it's indoor. So it's not taking into account your irrigation or your outdoor water requirements. It's it's very specifically and very, like, very on point with only fixtures. So, <clears throat> oh, wait, where was I? Yeah. So this does not take into consideration the outdoor water requirements, like I said, nor the water required before the building is occupied. So it is important to design efficient water systems as a building's portable water consumption constitutes a large portion of the world's fresh water consumption. Keep that in mind, please. Now, collecting rooftop rainwater, treat, treating wastewater, reusing gray water are all very, very simple ways to reduce indoor, indoor water consumption. Like it's, it's not high tech. Collect water, simply treat it, and I mean, don't use it for portable purpose, purposes, but then you can obviously use them for these fixtures. Now, using fixtures that meet efficiency targets can also can also impact op operating costs. Sorry, about <clears throat> calculated only for indoor water use. This metric uses baseline and water sense values for five standard fixtures. Remember, five: shower, WC, urinal, sink, and dishwasher. Now, water sense is is more like a standard. They what they do is they tell you certain thresholds for each fixture. And if if your if your fixture is using more water than that, then it's not very efficient. And if you can make it use less than that, then that's an improvement. And you have water aerators. I mean, uh, very simple thing that I can think of right now. You can fix water aerators on your shower. It it sort of lets the the water kind of throw out with pressure and with air in it. And that way, you pretty much don't realize it, but a lot less water is being used for it. You know, for for your shower. Again, this is an important credit and lead. <clears throat> the project can gain points under the under the water efficiency category. The fourth metric is the embodied and operational carbon emissions. Uh, this is important. Now, this is where actually things become a little complex, and and this is something which kind of um, looks through and through at the entire project. So. <clears throat> Embodied carbon emissions refer to the greenhouse gases emitted during the extraction, manufacture, transportation, assembly, replacement, and deconstruction of building materials together with the end of life profile. So you see like the first that we looked at was just after the building gets operational, but not here. Now, these CO2s, they're being measured from the very point your material starts to probably get mined till the, till the time it goes back to, to recycle or so it's it's a complete it's it's sort of the most complete boundary condition and it measures from cradle to grave. So, so and that's the reason that if evaluated early in the design process, about eighty percent of buildings embodied carbon can be reduced. So and and honestly, like you might think it's complicated at times, but it's really really very easy. You all you have to do is you have to like a simple strategy would be to use local materials. You don't want your stone to sort of be traveling uh, five hundred miles and and being mined at a very uh, unsustainable you know in, in, a, in a very unsustainable way so sometimes your strategies just require you to be aware aware of what needs to be done and that's pretty much it now operational carbon emissions refer to the greenhouse gases generated annually during the operational or in use phase of a building now this one is again operational or in use this includes the use management maintenance of, of a project or structure along with the energy consumed to run a building systems the carbon load is created by the use of energy to condition, so like let's say heat or cool, and uh, and power a building. Now the use of highly efficient building systems and proper management can directly impact their energy consumption, reducing the carbon footprint. So again, that's important. Now this is the last one that we look at, and this is my favorite one because like at least when I'm designing, I always keep this one as uh, on one of my top top priorities. I don't know, it's probably a personal thing. I just enjoy having good views. <laughs> so the fifth and the final metric we will discuss is quality views. 
And uh, so this is a set of standards used to evaluate the effectiveness of a building's design to provide building occupants substantial and beneficial views, simple. Now, designing for quality views involves consideration of building orientation, site design, facade, and interior layout. So it, it kind of starts at the very beginning. How your, how your building is going to sit on the site pretty much defines on how your views would be. Now, research shows that the building occupants that can visually connect with outdoor environments while performing everyday tasks experience greater satisfaction, attentiveness, and productivity. So that's that's important. Like, Let's say if you're designing an office building, you don't want people to have a sick building syndrome. Now, there are other factors as well to take into account and not do that, but quality views is also one of that, one of them. In fact, in healthcare facilities, views and access to nature can shorten hospital stays, reduce stress, depression, and the use of pain, pain medication. Again, doing this can get you extra points and leads. So they have a specific category for hospitals and providing kind of outdoor spaces or good views or places of respite will get you these are like three different credits I just mentioned which pretty much can be tackled by one of the one one by one strategy so on the right hand side now that's that's a different thing that I just wanted to bring that out because I felt like uh, it was kind of interesting as well now in lead uh, the views are measured as per view factor so you have uh, view one which is like the worst one and then you have view five which is I would say the best one and, and that's pretty much how, how you can get more points. So if, if maximum views are in the view five, view four category, you gain more points. If, if, if you can see view one, I, I wouldn't want to sit and work there at least. Another thing that you should keep in mind when thinking about views is that um, good views, it's, I'm not necessarily saying have a river flowing outside or have a 25, like have your office on the 25th floor. That Those are not the fancy things I'm talking about. Quality views usually constitute of about five things. Uh, view, views of sky, views of flora, views of fauna, views of movement on the street. That's that that's something that you would not think of, but it catches visual attention and that, that's a good view. And the fourth is anything that's beyond 25 feet from your opening. So you don't want something that like stuck right in front of your opening. You don't want it to be like on top of each other and down. Now, keep in mind that being a building performance expert not only allows architects to create beautiful high performance buildings, but also allows them to produce healthy environments for occupants. Now, this brings us to pretty much the end of part one of the presentation where I was just going to talk about these key terms and keywords and metrics. And um, in the second part of the presentation, I will discuss three different projects, as I had mentioned to you before. I'm going to start with my, my master's thesis. And just to give you an idea, it was... Um, a different presentation because it's pretty heavy. And since this was an academic project, I'm so I'm, I'm going to try to try to do these three different projects in three different ways. And since this was an academic project, I'll try to present it pretty much in the same way as I did during my during my final submission in 2018. So, so I mean, if there are any students here, pretty I think most of them were. So you can actually even take some tips and tricks to how, how to use how to use simple diagrams or, or presentation techniques. Uh, I mean, if you find them helpful, obviously. <laughs> then the second one we'll look at is the competition. Again, that's a totally different way of doing projects. It's supposed to be all um, strategy and concept and kind of all concise. Not, and then the third one would be, would be pretty much a very professional office project that I'm going to look at. So uh, my master's thesis was titled Working with Wasteland. It was based in, in New Delhi. The idea was to seek an alternate perception of the landfill while simultaneously addressing the past and envisioning its future. Heavy words there, right? <laughs> so I, my partner was Pat Chapanon. He was from Thailand. He was, a, he was a landscape designer, a very good one, in fact. And my guide was Hope Stoke, you guys. And uh, I think she was a Harvard graduate. She, she's right now working in, in Milan and Switzerland. So in the past few decades, solid waste management has become a global concern due to the rapid urbanization and changing lifestyles. Now, specific to New Delhi, many of the existing centralized waste management schemes have proven both ineffective and unsustainable. The, the, the evidence of this, uncollected waste bins and overflowing landfills. Now, growing by tons and mounds, garbage, uh, Delhi's garbage crisis may soon reach its breaking point, or, I mean, this was in 2018, so maybe it already has, I, I don't know. <laughs> Now, some numbers here might be a bit outdated, again, because 
like I did in 2018 and certain surveys were from 2014 or 15, I would say. I think the latest one I had was probably from 2016 at that point. So yeah, bear with me on that. Now, Delhi generates about 9,000 metric tons of solid waste every day, which is likely to increase to 20,000 metric tons per day by 2022. Now, slightly over 50% of this waste is recyclable. However, now keep this in mind, this is, this is very uh, disturbing data. Only 27% of the 50% is actually recycled. So less than one third of the total recyclable waste is recycled. So like half of it is already non-recyclable and the remaining half, only one third is actually is actually recycled. Now, solid waste management in Delhi is mainly based on the disposal of waste to, to four primary landfills in the city, uh, the Palswa landfill, the, and this is this is the project that we'll be working with, the Ghazipur landfill, Okla landfill, and the Narela Bhavana landfill. Now, here we see the relationship of all these four landfills with the city of New Delhi. And we're reading layers of soils, water bodies, green spaces, and mobility networks. So again, that was important because there were four landfills we had to choose sort of for one. And, and how do we decide on which one when all four, are, not four, actually all at least three out of the four have reached their capacity and, and kind of uh, giant mounds of garbage. So we worked on, on these four sites. So our, our, sorry, out of these four sites, we worked on the Bhalsva landfill in New Delhi. And popularly, it's known as the mountain of garbage. If you go on Google Earth, I'm not lying. They actually have images by that name. So now the, I, we felt at least on our side that this was the most critical one as it, as it was sitting right next to a water body. So if we're, uh, yeah. if we're looking at the small map here, you see there's a canal that's flowing. And so it was right next to the water body and that's, that's not a good sign for a landfill. So it was right next to a water channel leading to one of the most prominent, like important rivers in India, which was the Yamuna. And it's it's quite close to the center of New Delhi. You can you can see that that's the center right there and, and look at the proximity of it. And it's location on NH4. So I'm, I think if anybody is from Delhi in this, uh, in, in among the part of, participants, you might have noticed if you're coming down from Chandigarh and entering Delhi from NH, uh, NH44, NH24, I'm not, I'm not let me confuse that. You might have seen this huge mountain of garbage just on your left-hand side if you're entering Delhi. So yeah, th this was just some initial analysis that we were doing to sort of uh, decide on which one to work with. Now, the Bhalswa landfill, commissioned in 1994, 1993, my bad. Nearly, it was nearly 45 meters high. Again, outdated numbers, keep that in mind. So I don't even know how high, is it, how it, how high it is right now. So nearly 45 meters high and spanning an area of approximately 40 hectares, the site reaches, reached its capacity back in 2006. However, more than 2,500 tons of trash was dumped here daily until 2016. That's, that's just way too much. <laughs> now, the site has been a major source of air pollution due to frequent fires. Such landfill emissions are usually a result of anaerobic decomposition processes that happen within the landfill, producing large quantities of methane and carbon dioxide. Those are the two most important gases in a landfill, and both of them are greenhouse gases, and they lead to fires. So, yeah. Oh, and I have a beautiful thing to show you about the fire. Now, this is a GIF that shows the hourly average of particulate matter in the city. And if you see, that's where that's where the Pulsewa landfill is, right there on top, where you always, and you'll see there's always a yellow or a red or a, or a, I don't know, like dark brown color there, because there's there are constant fires. So we can clearly see the high levels of pollution around the site throughout the day. Now, this data was from 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th of July, 2018. Mm -hmm. And I know my presentation was supposed to be 27th of July, so it was four days before my presentation, this was the state of, uh, of pollution in New Delhi and, and around the site. But I mean, we also have to understand that it's not just the air in the area that's toxic, but it also has a major source of, it is also a major source of water pollution in the landfill. Now the city of Delhi lies in the floodplains of Yamuna River and its alluvial lithology makes it very susceptible to contamination by leaching of pollutants. So simple idea, right? Like we say that as, as strategies in, in, in architecture at times, we use perforated, uh, not perforated, it's not the right word, permeable, uh, permeable papers to let the water percolate to the ground because it's supposed to be a good strategy. Now imagine if that water is toxic, it just ruins everything. 
So as water percolates through the landfill, it carries the contaminants leached out from the solid waste, polluting the soil and the groundwater in the area. Now the ground, groundwater pollution vulnerability map, which is on the right hand side, that shows that our site lies in the highly vulnerable zone. So that's right there. On the left side where you have the, I think it's the electrical conductivity in groundwater, you can see that the high electrical conductivity around the site confirms, so it's right there, you see there's a dark patch just around the site. It confirms the leaching of metals from the site into the soil and groundwater. Now that's very concerning. I have no idea what's been happening about this at the moment. We then read the water table contours, the depth to water level and the hydrological flows to understand what kind of landscape engineering techniques to use to mitigate this pollution. Again, I would, I would say research and analysis is pretty much what would guide your project to be sustainable. You need to know exactly what can happen, what's feasible, how to achieve that, if it's even possible to achieve that, how the site is, what all, what all is impacted by the site and probably will be impacted by your design. So automatically all these decisions will, will eventually lead you to a sustainable design. So this is, I think, um, beautiful image. So that's the site. That's where the water flows. That's down to the Yamuna River. And you really don't require any high-tech software to see the color change. You can see how, how when these, these water channels which are flowing from Delhi, when they meet, meet Yamuna, you can clearly see the difference in the change of in the, in the change of color in the river. So this was a Google Earth image. This is no 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 like you know, some very high tech software. It's a very simple image. But it, I I would say it speaks a thousand words there. Now landfills and specific to our project, the Balswa landfill. While having a negative impact on the environment and the surrounding communities, we felt it held inherent potential to be transformed into a space that goes beyond depreciation and blight. Now, these dump sites have the capacity to tell stories about consumption as well as production. This is important as presently mass consumption is the overriding cultural experience, I would say. Like everybody's pretty much buying more than what they need. It's, it's just this huge consumer culture. Now, very simple diagrams again. On the left, we have the existing condition of the site. Let's say it's it's kind of showing the landfill. The middle is the green washing technique. So usually this is what it's done. This is what is usually done with, with landscape sites. They kind of, uh, how do you say, like they camouflage the contents of the site. They just repurpose the sites, camouflage the contents, and it's, it's, it's called like a green washing technique, making it beautiful again. Now, what we were trying to do with this site was to, was to use an integrative approach to ecologically heal the site and at the same time recognize the contents of the landfill and contribute to the identity of the site because we don't want people to forget it was a landfill. It's, it's very important for people to understand what it was and how it was and how to change, how to change it. Now that's how we reached the research question for our master's thesis here. It was how to design an urban park on a landfill that makes the public realm be stitched back to its to this public works while simultaneously cultivating dynamic thinking. You know, it's much easier to write than, than read it. <laughs> cultivating dynamic thinking by making visible the past connections between individual human behavior, collective identity, and the large consumptive and ecological processes. Now, these were heavy words specifically used for the thesis. Simply put, the project will take something that's generally isolated and it's going to bring it back back into, into the public realm. And it's going to try to make it a public amenity and an educational tool. That's, that's the simple idea that we were trying to do here. However, one must understand that, uh, you know, in order to, again, it's, this was, now this analysis that you see, this was, again, it was like uh, looking for precedence, I would say. So if you're designing a green space, you cannot design a suitable green space without understanding what green spaces already exist in the area around. So... Just to let you know, it was we didn't have enough resources to really uh, uh, document all the green spaces existing in Delhi. So instead, what we did was we used the Delhi 2020 master, 2021 master plan as, as the base document. And we, we kind of took all the green spaces listed in the master plan. And we tried to study the social relationship of these green spaces with the neighborhoods. So just to give you an example, um, I don't know how... If everyone's here from Delhi or what, but like, let's say a park which is inside your society or, or just next to your society where probably you go to play cricket or, or just chill, that's a different green space than probably uh, 
a, a Jawaharlal Nehru Park. So like that's that's completely there's a, there's a biodiversity park in Gurgaon. That's a completely different kind of typology of green space. So there were these different topologies of green spaces in Delhi. There was landmark green, so like sports green spaces, so like JLN Stadium. There was historical greens, so like let's say the the landscape areas around the around the Hoskas Hoskas Madrasa. There were city greens, so there were different kind of green spaces, and we tried to see how they were working in terms of the social aspect of this, of social aspect of of, of it. Now, this analysis helped us to identify the two of the most suitable and most associated green spaces in the city, which are regional greens, which are like the biodiversity parks or natural reserves, and the city greens, which are mainly like consist, which mainly consists of district parks and neighborhood parks. So, we felt that these two were the most associated with. Now, this is prim This was primarily because of the kind of natural uh, retreat and the multitude of activities that these were these these would offer, respectively. <clears throat> And we believe that a balanced combination of both of these green spaces could prove to be a suitable green space in the city, provided the, the design respects the geography and the cultural history of the site. Now, following this, we zoom into the site area to look at the various green spaces present around the site. This forms the base of our urban strategy, which was to transform the site into sort of an ecological corridor along the canal, connecting the urban agricultural areas around the river to the agricultural belt present at the periphery of the city. So Delhi has a green belt, at least the master plan had it. So it was not far from our site. And then the master plan also highlighted that the, the Yamuna riverbed was supposed to be an agricultural green land. So agricultural green belt, my bad. So we want to sort of connect this along the water channel, which flew next to our site. So to kind of create like an ecological corridor altogether. Uh, it might seem utopian, but I mean, we still had to imagine or envision something. <laughs> We further zoom into our site to understand the urban fabric, the mobility network, and the water bodies. Now we identify three different kinds of urban settlements around the site. One was planned, second was semi-planned, and third was informal settlements or slums. And all three of them were using their green spaces differently. In fact, the informal settlements present right next to our site, uh, it, lacked pro it, it lacked proper clean green spaces, and it was using any sort of a vacant plot or, or an open piece of land for their green space requirements. They didn't, they didn't really have formal spaces. Again, I'm, I'm constantly talking about, sorry, that was my morning coffee. So I'm constantly talking about identity of the site, but you cannot really relate to it unless you've studied it. So this is where we zoom onto the site and try to understand its spatial and temporal character. So it's not just what it's looking right now, it's how it evolved over the years. We explore its evolution over time, both in plan and section. Now this helped us to understand how our design could contribute to the identity of the site because we were quite adamant on making people realize it was a landfill. Apparently just having the landfill doesn't help enough. Now here we understand the physical attributes of the site and analyze the site in terms of slope percentage, surface water flow, and landform features. Now this helps us to understand the buildable areas and the different kind of landscape, landscape spaces that we could create on site. So you have to understand like when you're working with landscape or even architecture, it shouldn't be that you wake up one day, look at the site plan and be like, this is what I want, this, this is what I want, this, this is what I want to do now. You're, you have to research, you have to analyze, and you have to let your site conditions, your context, your, your other parameters sort of guide you. Because the moment you sort of go against them, that's when your design, you're, you're going to make more effort, spend more energy to build something which is not suitable where it's supposed to be. So like, let's say, I mean, we have a hill-like condition there. So we, 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 so we want to use all these existing landscape features to define how the plan of the landscape park would be. We had a water edge right here at the bottom. We had some existing infrastructure. We wanted to use that as well. We had certain craters. So we saw like a massive water flow was happening onto this area and on this area as well. So all of all of these water flows and the and these slow percentages and these and these landscape features, they helped us to define and define the spaces essentially. So this was our site strategy uh, to conduct ecological restoration of the site to reestablish biodiversity in the landscape, to enhance social interaction by reconnecting the surrounding communities with the water edge, and address the history of the site and use landscape features to reveal new metaphors about the landfill. 
And this was sort of like a <laughs> like a poster or a manifesto that we created for for our thesis. And uh, we used a beautiful quote by by Kevin Lynch from What Time Is This Place? If these phenomena, waste and abandonment, are simply regarded with distaste, if our only hope is to hide them or push them further away from wherever we happen to be, then in time we shall live surrounded by our own excrement. So that's pretty much what, what's happening with Delhi right now. We have four active landfills, or at least like inactive on paper, but active in reality, and we're living with them, we're living among them. You, you cross them on a daily basis. But when we look at waste and scars with interest, we may learn how to integrate them into a continuous cycle of use. That's what we were trying to do. <clears throat> now, please note that more than half of my project is over and I still haven't gotten to the design. Because like I said before, analysis and research is the first step towards sustainability. It helps you understand what is suitable for the site and its surroundings, what is feasible on the site. So keep that in mind and let the site conditions guide you always. And that's the master plan of our project that we came up with. <clears throat> now, based on our analysis, we came up with the master plan, carefully considering the water flows, the context, the ecological treatment zones, and the program. And we primarily created four zones. So let's see if I can zoom in. Yeah. So there was supposed to be a community park, which was which was kind of next to this settlement area, which you see kind of penetrating onto the site. So it was supposed to be a community park to formalize the open space requirements for the settlements around, because we saw that they did not have formal open spaces. They were using open lots, if you, if you remember. The second was the waterfront, which is right here next to the canal. And this was supposed to be an ecological treatment zone, which was further to be a part of the urban ecological corridor, which I had mentioned before. Now, the third was a tropical garden zone. So our, our water flows analysis showed that this was this was kind of an area of heavy, heavy water collection, I would say, from the landfill. And it's also the way it was sloped, it, it was kind of collecting water from the settlement as well. So this was supposed to be like, like a collection pond uh, because it's, that's what pretty much it was already. <clears throat> and the final was the wetland zone, which is again, which is on the top side that you see here. And this was based again on the existing topography and the water flows through the site. So this was already a low-lying land. We, we didn't want to bring it up. We were just going to use the way it was. We were simply adding these, these bold walks and these trails that you see around the park. And that's pretty much what we were going to do with it. Everything else was simple remediation. Now, the most important aspect of the design was an interpretive landscape. Uh, so we, we kind of designed and we designed we designed an experiential trail which would kind of contribute to the identity of the site and it will encourage new interactions with waste and waste uh, sites. So if you see on this plan, this was pretty much all the architecture that we were doing. Very simple. So we didn't want to sort of intervene too much on a, on a, on a, on a contaminated site. So what we felt was that we everywhere else is just going to be more experiential and this is going to be more educational. And it's going to have just these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, yes, six spots that you can probably go through. And uh, I'm going to discuss these again in, in some time when we get to them. So now this was the first uh, first landscape zone. This was the this was the waterfront. It was designed as part of the urban ecological corridor, as I had mentioned before. <clears throat> now the way we went about uh, we went about tackling all the landscape spaces was that we're so I'm going to show these for all spaces. It's going to be an existing condition of how it looks and how it is at the moment. It's going to be priority actions, what we intended to do in the first place. And it's going to be the final vision that we had that how the, how the, final, how the space would eventually be, or at least we were hoping for it to be. <clears throat> now, we keeping in mind the, water, uh, the groundwater flows, this area was designed as a major treatment zone. And, and, and filtration walls and phytoremediation plants were used to clean the water flowing from the site into the canal. This was a very important thing we looked at in the beginning, that the canal eventually flows to the river, and then you saw how the colors were changing. So we wanted to firstly make sure that we're not leaching out any more contaminants into the water. So we were using filtration walls, phy phytoremediation plants, and all of the possibility, possible strategies to, to make as clean the water as possible that flows to the canal from our site. The second landscape zone is the community park. 
Now, this site was designed to formalize the green space requirements of the nearby settlements. And the first one is the existing condition of the site. The second one shows the priority actions of forming a buffer from the road and creating pathways and usable green spaces within the landscape. And the last is the final vision of the area with terraces and aromatic gardens. I feel aromatic gardens were important for a landfill. <laughs> so for the community park, we came up with, the, with three different zones, the active zone, the passive zone, and the event zone. We designed the space to, to provide for green space requirements for the nearby settlements, providing activities such as a playground, a kids zone, a dog park, space for weekly events and weekly markets. Now the vegetation scheme at the bottom, so we kind of had, uh, we didn't specifically lay out the trees. We just showed the vegetation scheme that we were gonna use on the section itself. And we tried to use pretty much all um, indigenous species. So you don't require a lot of maintenance or a lot of irrigation requirements for these. So it's it's not like it's not like the landscape gardens of British that were in Delhi, uh, even that exist right now. We try to sort of just use the species that can naturally grow in the surroundings with the least amount of maintenance possible. The third landscape zone were our green gardens. <clears throat> it, now this was carefully designed, keeping in mind the surface water flows from the site and the nearby settlements. Again, the first one is the existing condition, priority actions, and then ecological treatment zones and the trails. Again, so I'm gonna bring out a very small strategy. It's not that important, but it's just hard. It's just to show that sometimes very small ideas can make a difference. Now, if you see the first terrace here, it, it has a lot of, lot of plants that we're showing. The second one less, third one less, and the fourth one probably the least amongst them. Now you have to see that when you're designing landscapes and again, strategies can be replicated in architecture as well. You, you don't have to make or spend, you don't have to spend the energy, you don't have to make the effort to maintain and design a beautiful space altogether. Landscape works with nature. You know, it has it has its own time and rhythm that it will, it will use. So the way we looked at the space was that we knew that the water was already flowing down here. That's what the analysis told us. We were kind of designing these terraces to, to support the landscape because we do require supporting walls to hold the landscape in position. So we were putting these to kind of keep the landscape intact. Now we thought the seeds, the pollens, the plants, the branches, everything with the water will eventually flow down. So let's say you put one species here, you put a second species here, a third one here, a fourth one here. Keep in mind that none of them are invasive. Automatically, by the time the, the water reaches the bottom here, you're going to have a collection of a lot of species and seeds. So you're going to have a very uh, diverse sort of landscape that you're going to achieve. And the same for here, you don't have to plant a lot of uh, bushes or trees here because automatically the seeds are going to flow down right here. So very small thing that we thought of, nothing, nothing major there, but it's just trying to trying to work with what we have at the site with nature and and making the least amount of effort with effort in terms of energy wastage. I'm talking about not like effort. <clears throat> so yeah, we created a bioswale by modifying the landscape as a hydrological collective spot. Now the terraces will be used as filtration walls to purify the water before channeling it to the local aquifer. So it's, again, it's no longer uh, toxic. Now the trail, trail in this area will not only offer recreation, but also provide an educational purpose, making the visitors aware of the various ecological species because it's a diverse landscape that we're creating here. The final landscape zone is the wetlands. <clears throat> Now the wetlands is designed according to the existing topography and the surface flows through the site. Again, the existing conditions, the priority actions, and then what we eventually thought it could be. And once again, I would like to point out, we didn't create, we didn't dig up the land. We were not spending, our aim was not to spend any additional energy. So these were the natural contours. We simply, we were trying to just simply remediate what's happening at the site, remove the toxins, filtrate it. That's pretty much what we were doing. Now, the area will treat the hydrological pollu pollutions and enhance the biodiversity in the landscape. The area also offers a bird sanctuary. That was the, that was the island sort of in the middle that we were creating because it's right there. <clears throat> all right, so now we have understood how the park is working with all its different zones and, uh, and how the landscapes are working. And now I will focus on the primary trail, but I won't spend too much time there. And... Uh, as, as mentioned to you before, the, the purpose of this primary trail is to contribute to the identity of the site and encourage new interactions with the degraded landscape 
that help encourage a greater sense of awareness and connection to waste and its repercussions. Oh, my panels were heavy, so they require a different. <clears throat> So uh, we created these uh, these six different zones in the landscape, and I'm not gonna I'm not so each one of them had a, had a different purpose. Now I'm not gonna go too much into detail. Along with having a purpose, they were also uh, technologically required. <clears throat> so you have you, you you have a lot of these you have a lot of methane in the landfill. That's important to note because that methane can actually be collected and used as biogas. So it's it's a good thing. So we had these whole mechanisms in place and we thought about how these how these things would be done, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail here that this is supposed to be the entrance to that trail. And uh, <clears throat> we were just, we were kind of using very subtle, like our actions at times were very subtle to, to hint what we were achieving to do. As simple as if you look at this, uh, oh wait, our actions were subtle, but our names were very dramatic. So like wall of waste, breedscape, we, we, <laughs> we were full on Netflix fans there. So now if you look at the image on the top and um, what we did there was that basically we, we found a process available in one of the companies online where, where they could use certain materials from the waste, compress it, dehumidify it, and actually can, can, can make construction bricks out of them. <clears throat> so what we did was all the supporting walls which we had in the project, they were, they were kind of aimed to be made of the material available on the site itself. So you see you're reducing any, any material demand from outside. Apart from that, again, because our aim was not to greenwash the site, what we were trying to do is that we will we will have these walls, but we, we aimed to scrap the, the plaster from, from certain areas. So when the visitor is kind of viewing the landscape or at least crossing it, they can see what these walls are made out of. So like they should be aware of, of what's happening inside and that it's not something which can just simply be, be treated. It's, it hints the visitor of the toxic past and the constituents of this hill. So that was important for us. Again, these ones that you see, so it's it's not something monumental that we were trying to achieve. It was metaphorical maybe. But so landscape, uh, like a landfill, once you treat it, it requires, um, it requires sort of a ventilators because you're collecting the methane, you're collecting the carbon dioxide, but you cannot collect all of it, right? Like you will be missing it. So in order to not keep, in order to kind of stabilize the landfills, you require certain outlets in your landscape for these methane gases to sort of uh, let go in the air. You don't really have much option. You're going to collect as much as possible, but some will have you will have to use. So we try to have these pillars, and so this way, like when a person is kind of um, how do you say, when a person is 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 in the landscape around these spaces, they can see the gas release in the atmosphere and. And the ventilators will make the people aware of the toxic gases that get, that get released from the landfill and pollute the air, making people understand the negative impact of the site that it has on the atmosphere. Now, again, it was not just the atmosphere that the site was affecting or impacting, it was also the groundwater. So with this space, what we try to do is we try to sort of go a little underground. And the idea was to kind of disconnect the visitor from, from the landscape and 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 with the disturbed pattern of tiles that you see in the papers at the bottom, the idea was to sort of make the person realize that it's not just the just the visible thing that that's getting toxic or that's getting impacted by the landfill. It's also the underground water underground water cycle. Sorry, and it's supposed to kind of stress on the disturbance it, it causes to it. So small pockets on like small pockets in this in this pathway were created to collect rainwater. And the idea was that this rainwater would have sort of a dark appearance here because of the material used, and it's going to kind of uh, metaphorically re represent uh, the leachate, which which goes out from 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 the tower, from the landfill to the water. Okay, this is where we took really the advantage of being students, and uh, we we knew that this something like this was not possible or perhaps if you want to do something like this it's, it wouldn't really be sustainable because you would have to do too much but this is where we kind of took the advantage of, of it being an academic project and uh, we tried to create a, a museum of waste and um, this was this was sort of interesting because if you think about it the landfill was sanctioned in 1993 and it's 2021 right now so let's say if you so okay this was uh, this is a plan which has sections overlaid on on the different spaces so like this is the section of this space this is the section of this space now the final which was the museum of waste is sort of like a huge well dug in the landscape so 
but the bottom layer is going to be from 1993 because some things can never decompose. And the top layer will probably be from 2021. So you see, just like artifacts in a museum, you have these different layers, which are kind of representing different times in that the city has gone through and how the, how the waste has changed. So it's almost like artifacts that are visible to you. And excuse me. And this was the idea behind what we, we, what we were trying to do. And uh, so the, the visitor kind of passes through these different layers of garbage, each deposited at a different time and laid down like geological strata. So that was, that was, the, that was the intention behind it. And uh, it sort of, it, it, it kind of comes out eventually to a very contemplative space for self-reflection, which was supposed to be on the top. It was more like a memorial, I would say, the waste memorial. And this was the final point of the trail, which uh, connected the visitor, who was right now at this very moment on the top of the Balsawa landfill with the town that created it. So the walls are kind of pointing your view towards the city. And every person of the city has contributed to its being, including the visitor. So this was this was sort of the, the metaphorical idea that we were trying to portray that we are very much a part of this landscape. We contributed to it. We created it. And we want people to know just how toxic it is and, and not clean wash it. OK, so that brings me to the end of my, um, oh, let me go back, yeah, to my academic project. I'm going to move back to my first presentation now. <clears throat> Easy, nice one. OK, so this was. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to get some water. Anybody needs a five minutes break? Like if, wait, let me just go back to the chat. I don't know if uh, if people are following, if anybody needs a break, if, um, if, if all's good, if nobody, Alex has raised a hand. I mean, you need a break or you, you have a question? <laughs> Um, I have a question I would like to ask. Yes, go ahead, Alex. Uh, I'd like to ask, how do you produce like the drawings, like with the background Sorry. text and the graphs? Could you could you see that again? Uh, how do you produce like the drawings and the posters with like okay, the drawing so as a background? Uh, yes. So this, this one. <clears throat> now I think what we did. If you see, these are this was more like a pattern. I think this was uh, for this particular project. We we used SketchUp for creating the landscape. So oh, if, yeah, so it was mostly just SketchUp. So like all of this, which you're seeing in the panels, this is all Photoshop and all Illustrator. So like I would create the sections and everything on AutoCAD and everything else was just Photoshop and Illustrator. Again, wait, let me just get it like that. Yeah. <clears throat> so everything here, I would just kind of create these lines and everything quickly on Photoshop to get an idea of the perspective or perhaps in SketchUp even. And all the soil and the sky and the city and everything else that you're seeing on these sheets was, was entirely Photoshop. So for this one, we did not create an entire 3D 3D model. But for the master plan and for the 3D views we generated otherwise, we we kind of were using a very basic model from SketchUp just to let us give a, to kind of give us an idea of, of the of the scale. But apart from that, everything else was Photoshop and, and Illustrator for this one. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yes, Mina, I think you have raised your hand as well. You can go ahead with the question. Uh, yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, hi. Um, um, is there a, uh, can you please share a link um, so we can access the project and go through it? Uh, okay, sure. I mean, I think uh, I have I have my, my portfolio uploaded on Issue. I can send you a link for that one. Yes, and that would be great, please. Yeah, it's it's not the most updated one, but I think it, it pretty much covers these. Or if you would like... So would I can, it cover the Gallery of Decay? Um, I don't think I included that one in, so not this, I didn't include the particular, this particular image in my, in my portfolio, but I did include the project. Oh, okay. So I, I think, uh, okay. I think it, it had, it had like this space and a couple of other spaces, but not specifically okay. this one. Okay. Yep. That's I mean, actually quite an interesting one. Can you send me like a picture, just uh, that page as well? Oh no, because for sure. I, I mean, that, that really captured me. Now, what you could do is, I, I don't know if, if it's, um, I, I don't know how it's going to work if there's a certain area where I can share certain images of the presentation. Otherwise, if not, you could just reach me out on link, LinkedIn and I can send you a link with certain pictures or screenshots of these. Okay, yeah, that would be perfect. Uh, it's, uh, your name on LinkedIn will be the same as the one. The on same as the one, the same as the one perfect. here. So I'll just add I, you to LinkedIn then. Okay, so I could, I could probably share the images and, and 
because not all of them were a part of my portfolio. So that's why it was I kept my portfolio quite concise. So the other ones, okay. if you require some specific ones, I could send it to you while, while I like that. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much. Let me oh, it's just so different everywhere. Any more questions, anybody? Otherwise, I'll just, uh, or if anybody needs a break, or otherwise, I would just get on to uh, the next, like the final part of the presentation. Okay. <clears throat> so now this was, uh, this was, wait, just a second, I do. Yeah, so this was a competition entry I submitted last year, uh, Micro Home 2020. I think this was organized by Beep Readers. And uh, the idea was to create a tiny house made from recycled materials to reduce material demand and the subsequent waste generation and energy consumption. So again, we have, like I said before, if you're aware of how much the building would cost or what's going to happen to it eventually, you can reduce it in the very beginning by changing your decisions. <clears throat> And as discussed before, since the construction industry is responsible for a significant portion of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, my project Rehouse here aimed to, to be like an all-season eco-friendly micro-dwelling. And again, I'm, these ideas are, are, are kind of represented using a micro-dwelling, but they can very well be replicated in large-scale projects. Now, this was supposed to be something which could directly be transported to the desired destination or disassembled into smaller parts and taken to site for final assembly. So this would let you have clean work with no harm done to the surroundings. And so I felt like there was a hand up or something. No? Okay. I'm going to continue with the presentation in that case. Okay, so uh, for this one, let's start by looking at that closely. And um, so I think one of the strategies was the adaptability of the project, because I didn't want it to be a very, to be sort of placed in a very specific location. So the way I kind of envisioned it was that it could be moved as per the landscape. So it could, it could very well sit flat on the ground. If you had certain landscapes, you could have probably one or two stills on, on to, to kind of manage it still on a slope. It could be close to a river with, with higher stills. And sometimes people like to have more habitable space on the terrace. So instead of really getting your bricks or other kind of wall assemblies, you could just get this pre-made st structure assembled on the roof. Maybe you'll have to amend some structure of the building, but yeah, it could still be done. There's, I think there's a good, there's a firm in Barcelona that's already doing this. It's kind of uh, using a similar structure like that and they're kind of just installing it on top of the existing buildings. It's pretty interesting, have a look there. Uh, the second thing was to have flexibility in space, and, and especially now, I feel like after COVID, everybody has kind of realized that that our, our our places need to be flexible. I mean, right now, like I'm sitting in my living room, using it as a working space, so that that like our space needs to have that character to it now. So even in this tiny house, which is supposed to be just 25 square meters, what I did here was uh, I was kind of using efficient furniture assemblies and wall assemblies to kind of help me do that. Like, let's say we could just simply pull out a wall panel and uh, your living space could become a, an office or dining space. And then if you remove all your furniture, you could just extend your foot on it becomes an extra guest bedroom. Everything folded back up, you could use it as a yoga room. So that was pretty much what was happening there. And um, these were just the elevations I created. I, I So I didn't detail this one out, but I, I at least I envisioned to have a, have a heat recovery system in place for the small building. Again, that's probably... Uh, Let's say if you're if you're if you if you have a heated interior space and if you have a cold exterior space, let's say the project is in Montreal. And when you're losing air from inside the building for ventilation and you're getting new air, your new air is cold, and what the one that you're losing losing is hot. So again, your systems are working harder to make the hot, the new hot, the new cold air hot again. Sorry. So if you can in some manner get these two uh, airs in contact with each other then the new air will, will not be as cold as it's supposed to be. So automatically your energy loads would go down. So if you use efficient systems and efficient wall assemblies to be able to do that. Now that's a perspective section uh, for, for the small micro home. And uh, I think this was this one I created entirely on Revit and the section was pretty much done on, on Photoshop. Now what I was using, I was using Enviro both so like recycled wood and interior panels. And then again, like I said, foldable assembly, so you could kind of modify the space as per what you want. Even even the countertop was not like marble or quartz or something. It was simple recycled glass. It's you can find it everywhere. Just use it. <clears throat> again, I was using a solar solar panel on top on the roof, and um, 
it was to sort of help with the basic needs for, for the project. Again, solar panels are sustainable, but not everywhere. So you have to make sure that the use that you're kind of assigning to your solar panels is, is worthwhile. Otherwise, it just won't help you that much. I had a small uh, small kind of vegetable garden plant in the roof for, for your basic food supplies. Everything else was, was light colored, high solar reflective uh, gravel. Now, this was something which I haven't covered yet, but one thing which you should consider when, when designing, at least like real time projects, is is the is the heat island effect now i pretty i think everyone would be aware of this pretty much it's that your built environment is slightly warmer than your natural landscapes around it so that that's the phenomenon very simply put and your roofs your your parking lots all your all these hard paved surfaces they kind of contribute to it so you need to have very high solar reflective index roof and the easiest solution that I can imagine right now is gravel, light colored gravel. It's the cheapest, put it out, put it right there and it's going to take care of it. You can have green roofs, you can have solar panels, you can have other shading devices to sort of mitigate the heat island effect there. And um, finally, even the steel that I was using for the project was, um, was recycled. So that was the idea behind it. And on the right hand side, this was uh, this was a render created for, for the project. One of my friends helped me, helped me create this beautiful render for, for my Arabic model. And uh, so you can see the garden on top, the, the solar panels. And I mean, right now I placed it pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And that was the idea. You could, you could place it as and as in, as, 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 in what, as in when you like, or as and where you like, sorry. And another, I, another good thing about having it, having it sort of pre-made is, is that you could, you could play with, with the way you want your, your space to be. So right now, so like all of these interior walls could be shifted. So as simple as right now, I'm using this iteration for the project that I'm showing on the sheet. But if somebody else prefers to have it another way, you can have it. Sorry, I'm using this one, but someone else could have like this. Someone, someone might just prefer having a huge living, come working space in the middle and your bedroom and services on, on either corners of the, of, the, of, the, of the structure. So it was supposed to be like that. It was supposed to be sort of modifiable and, and personalizable. And that was the idea behind it, to give it a certain modularity. Now the last project I'm going to discuss is is a project which I worked on um, at my at my present office, and just get me a little bit. Just let me get a little more water. Okay. <clears throat> so this was at now in in Montreal, Canada, and this is the final one for the, for today. And I'm going to try to make this interactive. I'm going to show you certain images and you can tell me what strategies you can think about or what strategies come to your mind. <laughs> but this was, uh, honestly, this was a very interesting project that I worked on. And uh, this was located between an upcoming residential neighborhood and a business district. So you can see the downtown right in front of you and everything pretty much in this area behind you was residential. So it was an interesting site. And we wanted to develop something that catered to both of these distinct contexts. So that was an interesting thing. <clears throat> uh, an important design design decision was to keep the project completely permeable. So we didn't. Uh, so what you see here, this plan was created by the landscape architects that we were working with, and we wanted to have a free flow of pedestrian and bike traffic through our site. So we didn't place any boundary walls or grills. It was kept completely open and permeable. So. You have a street coming from the top and then you we kind of create like a linear park and you have water kind of down south uh, here. So we are to have this free flow and, and not really strict, restrict somebody and restrict somebody's movement altogether. <clears throat> also, there's a very famous brewery right here. So we wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to let the people access that relatively quickly. And um, now considering that that commercial space right there, we, we kind of created also a plaza here so that you have these four streets which are merging at this point and we just wanted to have an extension of of this public space so uh, onto our site onto our project so you have these cafes and everything right there and uh yep that was pretty much it for this <clears throat> now the landscape was carefully looked at to cater the physically challenged as well so this is pretty much the, and that was pretty much which defined all the levels and slopes within the site so we used whatever was existing and we we saw that if the existing was not permitting us to to sort of help the physically challenged access the landscape that's the only time you're making modifications everything else was just existing and as you can see we had bike paths going through it as well so yeah <clears throat> 
And what we did was we were kind of working on a live, work, play concept, which was which was important, like I said, residential business. We developed three different buildings, which were to be constructed in three different phases. And uh, one was entirely residential. One, one was office at the five floors, which is this one, office at the five floors and then residential on top. The other, other one was school at the first five floors and residential on top. And uh, keep in mind that like the ground floor of all these buildings was kept commercial or business so to keep the area lively even in the evenings after the offices and schools were not functioning. So that was an important design decision. <clears throat> also, because the mixed use topology was was developed to attract a variety of, of variety of residents and in turn create dynamic mix of people here. Uh, so this is kind of keeping in mind both the economic sustainability and the social sustainability we, we looked at in the very beginning. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, and once, well, yes, another thing which which I would like to point out here is uh, this is, again, a part of lead as well, not the project, the strategy I'm going to highlight right now. We also try to make flexible use of spaces. So you see, let's say we have an office here, and I mean, we did actually. So let's say this is the office space right there. And if you see, this is kind of the only uh, curtain wall that you see around in the project. Everything else was relatively punched windows. And uh, the reason behind doing that was, was firstly, obviously, to let the office have good views of the courtyard and everything during the daytime. And at night, when the offices were shut, you could actually have projections on these walls. And, and, and you know, like the residents of the project could very well be sitting right here and watching a movie in the evening. I would, I would like to enjoy that space. The same was with the school. So uh, there was a, there was supposed to be like a gymnasium or a theater or something within the within the school, and the residents could use it in the evenings or at night during off hours. And uh, so, like this was a small play area for the children next to the school, and it was very much accessible at the end of it when when the school was shut, like in the evenings. So this was something which we kept in mind. This was this was the idea of uh, kind of flexible use of spaces. And uh, this is pretty much a requirement for, for leads, so for schools. So yeah, keep that in mind. Now, let's look at this. And um, I don't know, I think we've talked about, not specifically talked about strategies, but I have covered plenty of them now. And I would like to see if just by looking at this view, can you point out certain strategies that were used here? Anybody? It doesn't have to be very high tech technology. It's very easy, very simple. Just trying to mitigate certain certain uh, ill effects. Mm, nobody. That's sad. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll bring them out. <clears throat> so it was very simple strategies were used again. It was um, all all the pathways that you see in the landscape were permeable to let the water percolate to the ground and. Um, Ample green spaces were provided on the building rooftops. This was again, this was to help with the with the heat island effect I just mentioned. If you see <clears throat> the roof finish is also light colored, so high solar reflective index again. That was for the heat island effect. Certain uh, like personal food gardens were kind of provided to certain uh, like selective apartments. Uh, water reuse to maintain the landscape and the use of adaptive and native species to reduce uh, irrigation demand altogether in the landscape. That was also a very, very important point because a large, a large portion of the water required in the building goes to irrigation and exterior requirements, and we didn't want that. So that was an important consideration. The use of light colored gravel, as I pointed out, on the roof to mitigate the heat island effect. <clears throat> South facing buildings to gain maximum light during winters. Again, this was a project in Montreal. Probably that's not going to be the strategy for if you're building in New Delhi. It's going to be north facing buildings, I would say, if I'm not mistaken, because you don't want a lot of south heat. Then creating efficient wall and roof assemblies to keep the building well insulated. So that's again an important point because you don't want your systems to be overloaded in winters, at least here, because you can just simply stop the heat from uh, the, the cold from coming in. Uh, there were also photovoltaic panels installed to provide energy to landscape lighting. So we didn't use them for the buildings, but we did use them for all the landscape lightings in the evening. So <clears throat> we didn't really require any energy from the from the city utility. In fact, even the number of parking spaces that were to be in the project were reduced. So there was a, this was like an intentional decision and. Uh, this was done to sort of kind of uh, push people because we had ample bus stops next to the site. We had a we have a, a, a main tra train station close to our site. <clears throat> we had bike paths close to our site. We had a metro station as well. So this was to push people to not use personal cars. I mean, 
worst case, you could just order an Uber. But otherwise, we pretty much had all 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 the the public transportation systems that you can think of, and so we intentionally reduced the parking that was supposed to be in the site. And then a detailed construction and demolition plan, like waste management plan, was also uh, also kept in mind to divert the materials from the landfill. And we've already seen that that's important, right? Because <clears throat> you can just segregate all the materials on site during the construction and get them recycled. You don't have to blindly send everything to the landfill. That's important. So uh, honestly, I feel like this this being a re regular residential building, I believe the project, this one at least, did try to push the envelope because you see like not all the people, not all the clients, not all the city uh, city municipalities are open to certain things. And we here we try to sort of create a balance between the strategies used. So it was, let us say that we were kind of, we would we try to get back in return from the project as much as we were investing in it. And then that way pretty much everybody was happy. So if you're able to strike that balance, it's it's kind of good enough. And in terms of the architecture, like the aesthetics that you see here, it was, um, I mean, this neighborhood has had a lot of industries and workshops and that are, now, that are now being converted into, let's say, office spaces, residential spaces, commercial spaces. So we kind of took, we sort of wanted to replicate those architecture, especially in brick around the site and, and the details as well. So that's that's what you see here, um, if I can zoom in on them. Like those details, they were already existing in the neighborhood. We, sem we simply kind of brought it from different areas around and kind of replicated onto the project. These arches that you see, they were they were right on the next building that you that if you see there, it was the same detail used for these. Again, so even the designs that that we're using here, it was pretty much what the site and the context guided us to to make. It was not that we're just going to open our eye and get something and be like, this is what we want now. And in terms of contemporality, what we did, we used this uh, this kind of dark colored, dark gray, charcoal colored steel and, and glass to sort of add a little modern and contemporary feel to the building. But everything else was was kind of defined pretty much by by the surroundings and the context. <clears throat> uh, th these are just the strategies, but they're written in French and uh, I've already discussed most of them. This was the plan. This was like the first phase of the project that we were working with. So this was supposed to be a residential building and it had office spaces at the bottom. And uh, so these commercial spaces, and then you could you just had like a connection within these commercial or office spaces to go to the residential spaces above them. So it was like a like a one unit. <clears throat> so you you literally walk where you live. Yeah. So that brings us to the end of my my presentation here today. And we still have ten minutes left. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going to stop presenting. I'm going to try to turn off my turn on my camera. Can you see me? Okay, that's good. Uh, Anu Anu has a question. I think she raised her hand. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Hi, Anu. Uh, regarding your second, second project. Yeah. So I wanted to know uh, the uh, wall, uh, the detail of wall structure. It was I can I think it's it was from the outside. It was a metal, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so yeah, after uh, so I just wanted to know the detail how metal. Um, hmm? I'm just gonna go back to it to see what it was. Um, this what you're talking about is the competition entry, right? Yeah. Yes. The the micro home that I presented. Yes. Uh, uh, oh wait, I'm just gonna wait. How do I go back? Because I'm I stopped sharing my screen. I forgot about that. Um, share your entire screen. Okay, share. You able to see my screen? Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. All right. So I think uh, I'm just gonna look closely here because I don't even remember this was done last year, but. That was roof. That was the wall. So it was recycled eco steel panels that I was using for the exterior uh, kind of cladding. And then in the middle we had semi rigid rock fiber insulation because uh, I mean, I mean, I was kind of imagining it to be at least in Canada when I was doing the project. So we were kind of kind of using uh, heavy insulation for for the winters. Then it's the metal framing with rock fiber insulation within that, and then there was a vapor barrier, and then finally the recycled and wire wood uh, wood lining which was to be inside. So again, because it was, yeah. So what is the, you know, uh, climate that was taken into consideration? So for this one that you, 
that you see here for the wall and roof and the floor assemblies, this was a slightly colder climate. So like I was, I was when I was working on this, like I said, I was imagining all these spaces, which I pointed out, I was imagining for these to be at least in Canada. But again, because it was supposed to be prefabricated and completely modular, you could modify and adjust these wall compositions if it was supposed to be based somewhere else. So this was a colder climate. This was somewhere where I would expect the windows to be harsh. And that's why we're using kind of two layers of insulation. But let's say if I have to place this building in New Delhi, I wouldn't really require that because we just have two months of winters. And I mean, they're harsh, but you could have, you could definitely go get away with less uh, insulation that's required there. Uh, so in a cold climate, if there is a, a snowfall, then mm -hmm. how is, is the gr uh, green roof going to work? So in the winters, it's not going to work. No. <clears throat> yeah. So that's something that we have to, so in Montreal, uh, Montreal has a lot of food gardens and, and urban uh, rooftop gardens in Montreal. And they're pretty much, their functioning happens between, I would say, April and September, October maximum. And in the winters, then they don't work. If you want your garden to work in the winters, you would require to sort of, um, like I would require an additional roof here on top of my structure. It's going to be made with glass, but again, it's going to have to have certain assemblies to withstand the winter uh, climate. And uh, that's, again, a design decision that you have to think about. So why, why, I say, why I'm saying that is like when I'm looking at this very small building, yeah. I would rather go out and get my, my food supplies or groceries from a nearby uh, store or, or farm or something than spend that much material and energy to create something that small on top here. So unless, so I, because I know there's something, there are a lot of farms in Montreal, which use that technique. It's basically, they create these huge farms on rooftops and they have certain structures to, to be able to withstand and manage those farms in winters. But that makes sense because they're huge. So they're kind of catering to a larger population. So the energy that you're spending to, to manage those farms, it's fine because you're managing a larger population with those farms as well. But for this one, I wouldn't really... Uh, uh, how, to say, how should I say, like, I wouldn't really think of having a special structure just to maintain a small rooftop garden. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for uh, for winter, so uh, there need to be modification, right? The roof mm -hmm. or terrace? Or for sure. So this was because it, because it was a competition entry. I didn't really uh, go into too much analysis and issues okay. and, and like a third, through and through uh, study. What I was aiming here was to present a certain idea that this is what it is and you can always modify it because it's not something which is permanent it's resilient so like i said if you want to have this in delhi or some other city you can modify the wall assemblies the roof assemblies and and it's going to work everywhere it's just mm -hmm. it just it was just an idea that i was trying to sell and certain strategies that i was trying to sell here mm -hmm. but and and i was not really trying to sell the final product here that was not the intention right. okay uh, yeah. so i have another another question also go ahead no no please go ahead uh, the third project you shared, uh, that, that's that's a, a real project, right? This one? That's a real project, yes. Uh, yeah, there was a, a detail on uh, green roof. Uh, could you please uh, share the details? Green roof, I saw. Yeah, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. The upper one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't... I don't green, right? Yeah. yeah, this is a green roof. Now I don't have a detail. I don't have a detail right here in the presentation, but I could definitely share one with you, the one that we usually use okay. or use. And uh, just keep in mind that when you're doing green roofs, you cannot really, at least what we typically do is we don't really go all the way to the edge of the assembly here because that's where your floor and walls are meeting together. Mm -hmm. So we kind of stop the green roof about at least half a meter from, from the exterior edge. And you have these, um, I don't know if I have that exact detail there. Back. Uh, is that course uh, aggregate? Uh, you, just, you just say that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, this one could be gravel, could be coarse aggregate, could be anything. You have a certain membrane here to stop the green roof. You have your drainage panels and your drainage boards and insulation below that. Mm -hmm. And that sort of a buffer is required from the exterior wall. I can, I mean, I think this one is probably, uh, you can find this project on bebreeders.com. It was, uh, it was selected among the I think it was shortlisted among, amongst the finalists, but it didn't win. Mm -hmm. So they still have the project online on bpreduce.com, microhome2020. Mm -hmm. And you can find all these images in detail, in high definition, everything on their website, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, could you share, could you, could you tell me the how how do we separate the two layers, you know, uh, the, 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 the one with the dotted 
black dot uh, line, you know, you can see it. Yeah. What is that? This one. Do you know? Yeah, yeah, that membrane. Is mm, that plastic or? Uh, Sorry, what? Uh, is that plastic? No, 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 no. It's definitely not plastic. So I know like different. Uh, uh, okay, it might be plastic. It's not exact because I'm, I'm trying to remember the the manufacturer I was recently working with, but it's. Because I know different manufacturers have a different membrane or different detail for that one. I haven't really worked uh, absolutely on site with one of the, them right like at, till, till now. Mm -hmm. But I know like it could be it could be a certain it's not plastic, but like how should I say like um, like an alloy that uses plastic or even metal at times. That just depends on how the manufacturer is kind of going ahead with it, mm -hmm. and what's suitable about where you live as well. So like let's say if if I have hypothetically if i have certain materials available in my local area then that's what the manufacturer would prefer to use as well okay. but yeah, it's, uh, and uh, you just mentioned that uh, there need to be a gap uh, between the wall and the uh, you know uh, mud mud right i mean oh uh, yeah yeah why is that so uh, the reason i mean yeah. so honestly i i knew about it because there was a regulation for that but i mean what i would say is that uh, you don't want your your daily water and and your irrigation that would go into this to also be very close to your wall and flow junction. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm not very sure exactly as to if this is the only reason for it. So I could definitely get back to you about being what's the exact reason for it. But at least from my understanding, that would be the that would be one of them because okay. you require a certain because this is going to be treated, this space is going to be treated differently and you don't want that treatment to be very close to this junction right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why if you see there are like multiple layers of, of waterproofing where this junction is starting because you don't want the moisture to sort of percolate into the walls. Uh, is the um, uh, aggregate uh, directly connected to drain? Uh, so I think they have they have these drainage panels under the roof. So your water would go in the like on the roof and then it's going to percolate down and then it has these drainage panels drainage boards on the roof membrane itself and then your water is going to flow to to one side or, or probably a drain wherever you kind of mm -hmm. make it mm -hmm. okay. so in in my case it was pretty much sloping on one side so <clears throat> mm -hmm. but otherwise you have these so you don't require like these uh, separately like it's it's a very much a membrane under your roof itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay thank you no problem I'm going to go back to here, stop presenting. So anybody has any any more questions, anything regarding uh, what I talked about, even anything about the graphics, anything, I'll be happy to answer about it. Yes, Mina, I see your hands up. Yes, you can go. Uh, yeah, hi. I just wanted to mention that um, I added you on LinkedIn, but I couldn't send you a message. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's because it's yeah. not permitted. So I'll have to accept it then. Yeah. You uh, don't worry okay, about that. I'm going to do it right after after this. Okay. Presentation. Thank you. And don't so, forget to send me uh, no, the link no to your. Don't worry, yes, man. I will do it for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And if anybody has any of the questions, like it, it could even be like in terms of any certifications, like lean, green, passive house, anything, or even uh, even what I talked about during the presentation, any strategies, any softwares, any graphics, I'll be happy to answer if there's anything. Yes, yes, me. Um, is it okay to still contact you after the class in case I wanted um, clarification on certain things? Oh, yes, yes, for sure. There's no issue about that. Thank yeah. you so much. No problem. So, anybody else? Uh, I have a question. Hi, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, can you recommend uh, software for solar or wind analysis or, you know? So, okay, I forgot to mention that. So, I know... Um, so if your project, I don't know which software you are usually um, using in general for your for your work, but I know you could do a solar analysis within Revit itself, but you do require to sort of geo-reference your project. Again, it sounds difficult. It's actually a very easy process. You just have to have it placed perfectly as per your site, and then you could generate a solar analysis from Revit itself. You could even generate your view analysis, uh, your heat analysis of heat. I think it was the solar heat analysis from Revit as well. There is another tool which I know we're kind of right now exploring at the office. It's called Cove Tool, and um, that's something that we're working with. We haven't really explored it much in detail, but what we've understood for that is that if you want your analysis from Cove Software, Cove Tool, 
uh, there is certain amount of extra effort and work required to be done on your models from SketchUp or Revit so that the Cove tool can sort of generate uh, like good results from it, I would say. So that's uh, something which is, again, that's being explored at the moment. Um, wind, I'm trying to remember wind. I'm forgetting the name of it. But otherwise, for wind, usually what we were doing is... Um, so we don't analyze, at least from what I'm, I've been working with, we, we don't analyze the wind itself on the project. On the project itself, that's something eventually which is done sometimes by the client or additional energy model makers, energy modelers. But as as a first hand, uh, first step when we're starting with the project, we use energy graphs. Uh, so we are sorry, we use wind graphs and and wind um, like wind and information from from the from the city data. To understand which is the side where ventilation is coming maximum minimum what is the kind what's the good ventilation what's the bad ventilation so like we try to understand all of those again it's the strategies we use would be different because in montreal uh you don't want probably the wind to sort of be be very very fast or very uh, very strong in your project because in the winters that's going to be very harsh and again in delhi it's going to be the opposite because you would probably want your wind to kind of come at you as much force as possible because you would like it. So the strategies to tackle those would, would differ, but yeah, as starters, we use we use city data and and we probably have sometimes consultants that give us extra data on, on wind analysis, but we don't start with the software for wind, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I see Hemant is, oh, Yasmin has, so uh, has her hands up, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, it's not a question. Uh, just uh, the person that asked about um, solar analysis, I also know of uh, Ecotech. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know that. Um, mm -hmm. Ecotech is quite good for yeah. all those things as well. Yeah. So just so that she knows. Yeah, that's, that's true as well. So I haven't used Ecotech myself yet, but I know uh, sometimes at the office it's being used. And because um, pretty much as, as my role as an architect, as an architectural graduate, I'm not actively using all these softwares. I'm kind of managing or reading the results once I get them. So I don't have the hands-on knowledge of these softwares, at least not all of them, I would say. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of using more like my knowledge from lead or, or, or the background from sustainable architecture to just read and, and kind of choose the strategies to go with these. But yeah. But I mean, if you guys know that you could you could help each other very much because sometimes also the software that we're using at the office might be very different from what you would want as as a student. So that's also an important. Yeah, you kind yeah. Of actually, I used uh, Ecotech while I was a student. I found it quite easy to get the okay. um, quite, yeah quite easy to get all the data I needed for my sustainable project. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Oh, sorry. I just opened the chat and I see a lot of questions. I'll try to sort of answer these one by one. Uh, can you share the uh, your issue link? Okay, yes, I will share it for sure. Amazing works. Thank you, Subhi. Um, okay, Subhi has a question there. My question was, did you use any optimization? Oh, it moved. Any optimization strategies in your works? Subhi, could you elaborate a, a little bit on that question? I'm not really sure I get that. If Subhi is still here. Okay. I'll go to Priscilla's question. <clears throat> Do you feel uh, partnering with an energy provider that produces solar or wind power uh, and delivers it to the site is better than having on-site sources? Uh, I would say so, Priscilla. I mean, uh, wait, let me kind of wrap my hand around the question. So having a provider providing your energy than having it on-site. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't answer it in terms of being better or not, but yes, I would say that uh, kind of exploiting the site to get as much as you can from it would probably be the starting point, at least for me. And when I know I'm not able to not able to get the results or performance that I require, that's probably when I would move out to outside sources. <clears throat> but it's a very good question because in lead, both of these points are tackled separately. So there is one where you can get uh, renewable energy from a provider, and then that's that's that gets you points. And then the second one is when you kind of uh, use your site itself to to gener generate power, energy, electricity, anything, and that gets you additional points as well. So this is actually a very good question, but um, I think also I haven't uh, thought about that much because usually we as architects, we primarily are we take decisions about the site and the project itself. So I would say usually the, the, the decision about partnering with an energy provider is taken by the client. And 
on our part, we try to use the site as much as possible. And also I would say better than either of these would be reduction. So as much as much as you can reduce the demand for energy from what you're building, it's it, it would be the best way to go. And then you choose which strategies work best for you. Because I don't think not like not everywhere you would have these providers or not everywhere uh, y- your site could get you energy as well. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dahani. Thank you, my God. Thank you, Fatna. Uh, so can you share that website? Sun, uh, so Sun, Sanyam, I think you have, uh, so can you share that website? I'm not sure which website you're talking about here. If you can, um, is Sanyam still here? No, okay. Uh, you're okay, you're still here, yeah. Can you just tell me which, uh, like what do you mean by share that website? If, if there's a, because I'm, I don't, I, I'm not sure I remember correctly about the website. You could just write it down if there's a problem with the audio. And um, so is this presentation, which software you used? So for this presentation, it's uh, it was pretty much done. You were asking for the works or for my presentation? Because for my presentation, I used PowerPoint. <laughs> and for all the works, I was oh, like pretty much using Revit for my models. And just for, the, for my thesis project, I used SketchUp for the landscape because it's much easier to modulate some, um, some surfaces there. But... The, I think uh, mostly, yeah, and, and the final project project from my office, that was again on SketchUp. It wasn't on Revit. At least the renderings were from SketchUp. We started the project in Revit, and then the render kind of took it to SketchUp to, to get the renderings. And which software do you use for your plan section and 3D views in your portfolio? So um, I usually, for my academic projects, I was always using Revit, but I was never using Revit in detail. So I would always get my, my certain... Um, Oh, I would set certain views, get it out from Revit, and then that would have enough. That would give me enough idea of the proportions and scale, and then I would use Photoshop and Illustrator for for my views. Mostly, I would say. Sometimes I would directly get them from Revit, but then again, I would Photoshop them because I'm I'm not like at least it, with my knowledge base, I'm not a fan of the renderings I get from Revit. Probably, if you can manage the settings and modify them, you might just be very good at it. Lumion is something which is very easy and efficient. I feel like if my if my materials and finishes are kind of done well on Revit, I just that's my go-to software. I would just read, readily open Lumion or Enscape, and uh, I, I think it's the it's the quickest way to get uh, your renders or at least working renders. But definitely for the final ones, you do require Photoshop and Illustrator uh, probably on on them. And uh, like Photoshop, SketchUp, or uh, I, there is an issue with my mic, sorry about that. But what I mean is, let's say we find the radiation analysis and we want to reduce the analysis by finding the best form of the design by optimizing it to reduce the radiation. I'm going to read that again. That's almost like my thesis question. So there is an issue. Okay. Let's say we find the radiation analysis. So you mean like solar radiation analysis and uh, we want to reduce the analysis. So you're trying to say that we want to reduce the solar heat gain to our project, if I'm understanding correctly, by finding the best form of design. Okay. By finding the best form of design by optimizing it to reduce the radiation. So <clears throat> what I feel, what, if I understand correctly, you can let me know in the chat if that's right. What you're saying is that we find, uh, we kind of analyze the, the solar radiation and the solar heat gain. And we want to minimize it, and we want the project to, to not have like, not not have a sort of like a bad like we don't want the solar radiation to have a bad or ill influence on the project. If that's right, so I would say uh, your your shading devices, your innovative shading devices, would be the best way. I mean, firstly, the best way would be to to manage the orientation of the project in itself. That's that. That should be your starting point because you, <clears throat> based on what climate you're working with, you want certain sun to face the building and certain sun to not face the building. So, let's say in Montreal, I am not a fan of north face. Uh, like I'm not a fan of north uh, facing projects because my my heat gain is not happening. And good views, but I I don't get the sun. In Delhi, it's going to be uh, the opposite. North face is the one that everybody goes to because they don't want the, the, the direct sun from the south. So your orientation would play the maximum role. That's that's the starting point, I would say. 
Your second would be the sharing devices because again, that's uh, it's 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 very simple at times. There's no high tech technologies required. Sometimes it's pretty much like me getting sun in my eyes, wearing my sunglasses, or just closing them. That's or at least making them smaller. That's pretty much how you work with it. So. If you have uh, if you have west faces, if you have south faces, you want to reduce the heat gain from there. You use efficient wall assemblies so that your walls do not get heated and the heat does not enter the project. You use uh, you use efficient shading systems so that way you get enough light, but you don't get the the heat from it or even glare from it directly. That's what I talked about in the beginning about when I was talking about uh, the SDE, the spatial daylight autonomy, and the ASE. I think yeah. So I think these are these are the techniques that you would probably think of to, to sort of optimize uh, the, the solar radiation. So like, not that's that's not the right way of saying it. Not optimize it, but simply um, using it well for your project and and kind of removing the discomfort that it can cause to your project. So that's what I would say. Are there any other questions from anyone? Anything? So every time we have to calculate with orientation shading devices to see how much the radiation has reduced, uh, I would say yes. So I, I, the way we do it is that we first in the very beginning. So we so shading devices happen at a very later stage, and uh, your orientation happens at a very very early stage. These are two uh, two very distinct stages of of a project. Uh, how do you say like construction? I would say or project progress or how how it works. So in the very beginning, what we do is we kind of do a very uh, block model analysis. We we just give it the very basic form that we think we, we it, it's going to work well, and then just with block analysis and multiple block analysis, we understand what's the what's the perfect position of the building on site, its orientation and its shape, which will optimize uh, optimize the solar radiation. And once we have that kind of uh, anchored that this is exactly how it best works on site. That's when we start going on details. And that's when we start uh, to understand where our maximum openings can be, where where we want the views to be, where we want the services to face so that, uh, let's say in Delhi, I, I would probably put my services on the south because I don't I don't want windows there. I don't want openings there. So again, that's that happens at the second stage. And then once those, again, those are slightly working well, then the third stage happens the, the shading devices. That's that's a slightly more detail about your facade and treatments. So that's when you do the shading. So this way you're kind of doing an analysis at each stage and not doing it all together again and again. That's that's what that's what I'm trying to get at. So it's it's kind of like a linear process. And if you do it like that, I think it's it's probably the most efficient way to go about it. Could you please repeat the name of the small house competition? So uh, the small house competition was called Micro Home 2020. It's called Micro Home 2020. It was by B Breeders. Am I am I saying it right? B Breeders. Yes. It was by B Breeders. Yes, I was just confused. It was by something else. But it's Micro Home 2020. B, B Breeders. If you go to the website, if you go on find lists, you can find the you can find the entry which I was talking about here, and you can actually find some other very interesting entries as well. I think the winner was was very um, deserving. They had a very very efficient concept of working working the space with flexibility. So do check it out. <clears throat> Are there any uh, software to know the best forms from the analysis strategies? Uh, so you mean like softwares that would automatically generate forms for you after the analysis? Uh, I w I have, I'm not so sure about that. Because usually the way we do it is, I'm pretty sure there should be. That's, that's again, that's quite a lot of technology that we're using there. I'm not so going like used to it and um, what we do is we use uh, we use basic analysis and then we use our knowledge to sort of guide us about how we can how we can uh, modify change it but definitely if you're using certain softwares some of them allow you to probably do it in in in, in like life real time lifetime so like if you're modifying certain things you can directly see the impact it's having on your energy model so that's something that could be that could be helpful but um yeah, I, I can't think of a software which would automatically generate a shape to help you with the, with the analysis. Sorry about that. Could you share this website, Sayam Pandey? Yes, okay, I will. I don't have it open right now, but uh, you can probably reach me on LinkedIn and I can send you the website there. <coughs> Any software is the best one? Okay, I thought the radiation is checked 
all at once and not stepwise. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Subi, I I don't think so. I mean, at least I know for us when we're working, we try to we try to do it like stage wise because you see your building and your project kind of always keeps changing with different design decisions, different considerations. Could be because of the engineers, could be anything. So as and when we're making important design decisions, we try to make an analysis or at least a preliminary analysis to make sure things are not changing much. But like I said, if my form is finalized and if I am good, if I'm well aware of the orientation and what effect it's having on my project, automatically my my openings, my shading devices, my my, you know, like my design decisions would automatically be sort of guided by that analysis. So we usually do it pretty much one in the very beginning. And once the shape and the form and, and, and the areas and the volume are finalized, we tend to not go back at it because we're pretty much sure it's kind of working well. And then we just use our knowledge. And then the other time we're not analyzing it sometimes again, but if we see that the mechanical load is becoming heavier than what we would expect for the building to be from the initial, from the initial model, then we might look at it again. But it's not something that you keep doing it again and again. Once you, once your major design decision, decisions are made, you're probably good to good to go from there. It's it's, it's a good start to to start from there to to continue from there. Uh, thank you, Ayandika. So, anybody, any any other questions? Anything? Don't don't feel any questions are stupid, really. I've I've asked the funniest questions in my life. So. Thank you, Mayank. I, I heard that the grasshopper can get you forms depending upon the radiation. There you go. <clears throat> that's that's the best way of helping each other. Any other questions, guys? I guess there are no more questions. Thank you so okay, much, Mayank. So this was an amazing good. session, and we really enjoyed. Uh, thank you so much for organizing it. I thought I was just blabbering blankly, but thank you for saying that, and thank you for organizing the the session, and thank you everybody for taking out the time and joining it. Sure, thank really you so much, Mayank, once again, and thank you all for joining the session. Thank you. Well, have a good evening, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are.